Here we are, Hello Bass Live. We're back at it on a Thursday night. After a week off of sun and relaxation with the wife, we're back at it. And uh, what's going on, Kent? Not a whole lot. I am, uh, I'm doing the sun thing, not so much relaxation, but I'm down in Florida right now and uh, just trying to get out fishing a little bit, trying to stay sharp. Absolutely. Yeah, I was, uh, I was in Jamaica last week. I did. Nice. Uh, I did catch uh, one little snook about that long uh, on a, a, a tactical minnow on a jig head. I love it. Yeah, I saw your post. I was like, "Wow, that's uh, that's my favorite color too." So that thing works everywhere. Yeah, I mean, boot tail swim bait. I mean, a jig head. It will pretty much catch just about anything. They'll eat a minnow anywhere in the world. I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have a fun show back this week. Kent Middlestat, Kenny, what, uh, I think you have several identities. Where, where are you landing on social media these days? What do you, what do you go by, Kent? Uh, I think it's just Kenny Mitt Fishing. All right, Kenny yeah. Mitt Fishing. Got it. Shorten the last name because it's impossible to spell, so it's just M-I-T-T. It is a little tricky. I found myself fumbling with it, but I think I got it right in the description. So Kent uh, used to be Minnesota. Somehow on the Bassmaster, it shows you're a South Dakota resident now. Yeah, I uh, I just kind of I sort of just travel around with the tournaments and just live on the road. I sold my house in 2020, 2019, I think, and been doing the full time traveling thing. We live in our RV. That's where I'm at right now. Is in our home office in the RV. And uh, just kind of live on the road and need a place to call home. And South Dakota has some favorable laws for travelers. So uh, we decided to domicile there. We've got um, a lot that we rent in South Dakota, but don't spend a whole ton of time there. Just kind of live in Minnesota some in the summer and Florida in the winter and wherever else the tournaments go. Yeah, very cool. So you've been... Yeah, so Kent's from Minnesota. Pretty much grew up here, didn't you? Yeah. Kind of started doing the Bass Nation Club thing. Got into it over his head. Fell over. <laughs> I'm not over his head, but like crazy, like head over heels into bass fishing. I guess is what I'm saying. And uh, and uh, just ate up with it, like most of us. <clears throat> and uh, took the leap. Left his full time job. Kind of rearranged his finances. Downsized a little bit, and he's been kind of fishing the. I mean, the Bassmaster opens what full time for what like five, six years now, or how long has it been? Yeah, this will be my fifth year as a boater. I did it as a co-angler for one year before that. So this, this is, this will be my second time fishing all of the events in the opens. Yeah. I've done several single divisions over the years, but this will be my second time doing a full schedule. Nice. I'm assuming that uh, Johnny Ray's not talking about me. But maybe it is. <laughs> could could be. Um, so, and I, I've had, I guess, Kent and I have never fished together in the same boat that I'm aware of, unless unless I drew you as a cowing layer in a state tournament, like way long before I remember. Um, but uh, no, fished man, against not... each other plenty of times in various tournaments, and been on a few divisional teams together, and so gotten to know each other. Uh, and, Kent was actually like probably one of the first five or 10 guests I ever had on the Hello Bass live stream. Like you might notice the quality looks better. The sound probably sounds better. <laughs> I, I feel honored. It was, uh, you, you've been killing it and uh, appreciate you having me on. Awesome. Yeah. So I thought it was a good time. We actually tried to catch up a few other times, but Kent was always gone fishing opens and doing kind of things and uh, weren't able to get him uh, on the show. So here we are. What's up, Amy? Lots of familiar faces in there. Uh, Darius, Frank, Brendan. Just shout out a few. Um, so, yeah, the main focus tonight, we want to talk about the Bassmaster Opens, the EQs. Uh, kind of get your take as somebody that's fished four years of Bassmaster Opens at various, you know, one division, full division. You've done the co-angler. And now you're doing the full EQ. Kind of get your take. Really don't haven't asked you about it. Um, I assume that you don't hate it 
too much. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be fishing all nine. But uh, we'll, we'll kind of dive into that a little bit. Uh, maybe talk some some uh, uh, for, forward-facing sonar. I know you've gotten deep into that. You've got uh, definitely a soft spot in your heart for the spinning rod. So there'll be a lot of things to tackle tonight. Definitely has a soft spot for smallmouth. Uh, so we might touch on that. <clears throat> so lots, all my lots favorite things, things, Rich. Yeah. And then we can talk about my my uh, my new hoodie that I got at some point. It's pretty sharp. It's, it's a good looking hoodie. <clears throat> What's up, Bo? I see Andrew peeking in. Friends from Omnia. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Omnia representing. What's up, Andrew? All right. So there's, I guess, one, maybe just like what made you decide to, I guess, just go all in? Like, what was that decision like for you? Well, it's kind of a story. It, it, uh, it was, man, it was like keeping me up at night trying to decide what I was going to do. And I looked at fishing some other, um, tournament circuits out there and looked at fishing a single division of Bassmaster and sort of weighed all my options. And man, at the end of the day, it came down to like, I'm set up for what I'm doing. You know, like I sold my house, I live in an RV, travel around. Like this is, this is my main goal is to try and make it in professional fishing. And um, it just felt like, any other option would be a sacrifice or giving up. And I know a lot of people had to make sacrifices and, you know, it's a, it's a challenge to commit to doing all nine. And um, I, I totally understand that. But for me, it was just, I stretched everything that I could. I stretched budget. I stretched time off from work. I stretched everything possible to make this work. And um, yeah, it's just, it's what I love to do, and I just want to keep moving forward with it. Don't want to take a step back, and so ultimately, um, keeping the end goal in mind, like fishing all nine, was the only thing that made sense. Sure. Have you ever have you ever done any Toyotas? I have, and they're really good tournaments. I I fished one on Gunnersville and absolutely loved it. I thought it was ran really well. Um, it helped. I had a decent event there too but it um you know i i i I like that they still have a championship you know that's that's uh, attractive but um just to qualify for the invitationals i i personally that's not where i see myself going it's not what i've dreamt of my whole life and um i'm kind of bass master blue through and through kind of guy so i it's all I've ever done. The clubs I've always fished in were bass affiliated and um, just a whole, I don't know, just the whole classic and, you know, the angler of the year and the elite series. It just, that all means so much to me that um, that's just kind of where my heart lies, at least at this time in my life. For sure. <clears throat> Very cool. Uh, so I guess, there was a question here. Uh, Brandon wants to know best and worst part of the opens. If you could sum it up. Well, the best part for me is getting to travel around and fish new venues. And it's not just like you drop the boat in and go fishing and have fun. Like you, you, you go out and you grind and you, you find every little nuance and you've done all this research ahead of time. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a steep entry fee and it's a lot of money for a guy like me. So to try and, um, do, do my absolute best and doing homework and all that, and then get to the venue and actually put the boat in the water. It's like the coolest feeling ever just to like, sometimes you just erase everything that you studied and just start from scratch and you, you just the uncertainty, you never know what you're going to get into. And I, I just love that feeling of, going to new places and having a purpose while you're there to do well. Um, the worst part is trying to compete with 225 other boats on the water, plus local anglers and plus 
whatever else. It's just, it's so many boats. It makes basically any body of water feel like it fishes small. Like, I mean, any place like James river, we, we, we have 90 miles of river that we can catch a bass on and it doesn't matter where you go. Like there's no hidden creeks. There may be places where you can't get a bass boat and you can only get a flat bottom or something like that. So maybe some guys get some, some advantages there, but if you can get a bass into or a bass boat into a place, um, yeah, I mean, you're not having it to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. That's probably one of the things. I guess one of the things they're changing this year, right, is they are – there never was like – for, I guess, the foreseeable history, there has been no off-limits or any limits on info sharing up until, what, like the two, three days before the tournament. And now they've kind of – I guess the info didn't really change much, right? It's just the on-the-water changed. Yeah, that's right. So your- it's – It's more like five days of no info now. And then, which I guess could kind of help. Like there's, there's always people that talk about how they think so-and-so is getting a guide the weekend before. Um, So this kind of eliminates any of that. Right. Sort of paranoia or if some of, I don't know, maybe if that is a real thing, I don't know. It doesn't happen in any of the circles that I run with, but um, yeah, I get, um, but yeah, so five days and then thirty day off limits beforehand is a big change. So, and I'm I'm a proponent of it because um, I still do work a full time job, and so I'm I don't have the luxury to go and live on the lake for two weeks ahead of time, and um, so I, I feel like just in general it sort of levels the playing field, and I think it's I think it's good for the tournaments and hopefully better on the fisheries. We'll see. Yeah anything that makes the fishery a little less beat up uh, by the time Derby day rolls around is it's going to be good. Like that just, it's going to make it a better experience for everybody. I don't know. That's really going to change the outcome or the place or how like, but at least, <laughs> you know, when you scratch out a 40th, maybe you're, you're catching, uh, you know, 13 pounds a day instead of nine pounds a day. I don't know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Tap the like button if you guys want. That'd be awesome. Uh, it is a reality check to be back working and in the cold. So both of those were very harsh. Um, so speaking of uh, anglers on the water, has that ever created any confrontations for you during in practice or in tournaments? Or not for me. I, you know, I've uh, I've gotten a little huffy about someone coming in too close to me, but it's never turned into an issue. It's it's um yeah it's it's best just to communicate right away and i'm i feel like i'm pretty good at that if if someone's getting close i try and establish what their intentions are and how we can work together pretty much right away and that that basically avoids any of the confrontations but it does happen um normally it's it's usually pretty peaceful and people figure it out but yeah i I know i know a lot of people uh a lot more people hold in their rage about it than actually let it out. Like you'll hear a lot of people at the end of the day, oh, so-and-so is getting too close and whatnot. But I mean, we you sort of just get used to it fishing these larger fields. You're just going to have to deal with having boats around you. It's just the, mm-hmm. the way of the world. And it's hard. I mean, it's hard for some people. Like a lot of people don't like to fish around anybody else and Heck, I'm the same way too. If I have my option, I'd I'd way rather be off by myself somewhere. But, um, I mean, uh, like the last open I fished on the Upper Chesapeake, there was no option to go anywhere else because I didn't get a bite anywhere else except around where I started, which ended up being a pretty popular place. Do you feel like the opens have evolved much? I mean, obviously, you don't know. I mean, not you know this year with standing i mean obviously you'll learn more about it but like in the previous five years do you feel like they were pretty much the same year over year as far as or do you think there has been much of a shift i you know i i guess i haven't put too much thought into that i i think the competition has always been really stiff um you know 
One thing that I think is going to change a lot this year is I, I guess I haven't looked at the, I haven't looked at the numbers on it, but I don't know how many guys are coming over from the college program this year to do the EQs. And that's been a, that's been a big factor. I guess that was more of a shift. Maybe my second or third, third year in is a lot of the younger talent was coming in and doing really well. And I'm curious how that's going to shake out this year, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I like, I feel like, in previous years too, and this is kind of more speculation, but you didn't, in previous years, you would have more elite series guys fishing the opens. Last year, there weren't very many at all. And then this year, I can't imagine there will be either, but um, I guess we don't really know who the other 75 anglers are gonna be in each of the tournaments. Cause we, we know that there's 176 EQ Anglers are gonna that are gonna be fishing all nine, but the field size is up to two fifty this year. And so there's gonna be seventy five other guys that are just either cherry picking or just, you know, fishing a single division. I think there's maybe only like thirty people fishing a single division. So hmm. yeah. There are changes for sure. Yeah, I, I can see I, mean, I think what there's Kenta is fishing them all. There's like one or two elites or something like that. It's a really small number. Yeah. I would imagine it's definitely a handful fishing a division, you know, just to try to lock up a classic. Um, yeah. Or just to fill out kind of a, you know, ex- to get to that, you know, 15 tournament mark that a lot of them want to be at. <clears throat> so did the, did the, did the EQ, the all nine, did that, excite you make you feel like your odds were better did what, what was your kind of general gut feel when it was first announced because there's a lot of people right that maybe aren't in your position that you know had already kind of committed to like chasing that dream but there's a lot of people that were like oh man they they took out the working man you can't fish three tournaments and and make it and you've done all of the above you've done one division you've done two divisions you've done all of them so what were your thoughts yeah, I, I feel for that guy. I feel like I am that guy. I'm just stretching myself thin and trying to trying to make all nine work. But um, yeah, I guess my my gut reaction is kind of a mixture of emotions. Like I I've heard the concept of having a nine tournament division uh, for qualifying for a while. I I, I listen to BTL as well, and uh, Matt Pangrak on there has had that concept for a long time and I've kind of been on board I think it I think it has its merits but at the same time I think too the cream rises to the top and um you know like the the guys that that fish one division and qualify in their first year I mean the argument is is that person isn't ready for the elite series but the examples that I know of off the top of my head like a Bob Downey he's proven that he's ready. He's doing well. And, um, you know, there's other examples too. So I, I, I don't know, like, I, I don't feel exactly one way or the other. I just kind of have a mixture of emotions on it. Yeah. I, I feel like what Pangrak, what we originally touted, I think he actually saw that as like another layer <laughs> between the, uh, elite series and and the opens, right? I don't think he at the time was thinking that the the, the opens would become uh, the EQs. It, it's it's interesting. I mean, I see it both ways. Um, Bob definitely is probably a strong one to argue, uh, you know, against the change. You know, somebody like Jay Shakurit, but you know, Jay also has a pedigree. Did you know won a couple coins? So I mean, he wasn't just like a one and in. Uh, but I do think there is probably. I think it was probably more the like the the central division guys <laughs> that seemed to be the ones that made the best examples for the argument to go to the EQ, you know, where they'd have like Appalachia Bayan, Red River, and like Texoma, right? And it's like <clears throat> they barely drive in there, you know, you, you you could probably make it without like having a depth finder on your boat. And then all of a sudden you go from that to traveling all over the country and fishing largemouth and spotted bass and right. Uh, so I think that's, you know, probably some of the case against it. <clears throat> 
But overall, I think I I think from I don't think it necessarily is a talent thing, but I do think it makes you get prepared from a finance and lifestyle standpoint, so that when you do make it after fishing all nine, you're in a much better physical, mental, um, and you understand what it takes at that point. Because I do think there are some probably several anglers who have made it through a division or two that maybe you know talent wise were there but they probably didn't have everything else in their life together to really make a run like and, and put themselves in the best position and, and there's there's cases every situation examples pros and cons so i thought about that too and and i've heard that i've heard that theory i think um directly from bass that was one of their arguments for going to this format was that it that it will better prepare anglers for the elite series once they get there um but i can't i can't think of very many if any anglers in recent history that have qualified and then had to drop out because of finances or because they felt like they weren't ready maybe they don't perform as well the first couple of years i guess there could be an argument for that, but as far as, and maybe you don't want to name any names, but can you think of any elite series guys in the last few years that have had to drop out because of financial reasons? I, I think the last you person- know, it's, it's, always, it's always a little weird because it's, it's guys that aren't doing well. And sometimes it's like, oh yeah, I'm getting my elbow fixed or like it's family reasons or, you know what I mean? Like nobody typically comes out and says like, I can't afford to fish the new, the New York swing, but there's been a couple and I would say it's yeah. probably down a little bit, but I would say maybe like a few years back, it was even probably more common when the field was a little bigger. Um, and it's not a lot. It's still a few, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's a problem though. It's not I mean, systemic. It, it's not like, yeah. no, it's not like, 10 20 percent are like dropping out yeah no it's um i do think if overall the system's probably a little better just you know nine out of 175 versus you know three out of 200 um i think you can you can make a case that you get hot in a three tournament circuit, right? I mean, you got to be damn good. You got to be like hot for basically all three tournaments because you can only give up what 40, 50 points in a, in a division, right? So, I mean, you got to average a top 15 just about, uh, which is, it's no easy feat. So you, you don't, you don't necessarily luck into that. Uh, but you know, you can get some things that line up for you, right? Like you get the right schedule, things can work out. Whereas I feel like it definitely takes some of that, luck or just lining up of a schedule out of the equation when you spread it over nine. So I do think it will give us the best of the best. And it does give you a little bit of room. Like you spin a hub, <laughs> your season isn't lost, right? Like you spin a hub and can't, don't make way in one day in a three season or three tournaments. You, you might as well just <laughs> pack it up or it's just, uh, I'm fishing for the classic or I'm fishing for education or experience at that point. So, yeah, yeah, that's true for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so what what is there anything you've done this year in preparation for all nine that you maybe weren't doing in past years that like you feel like it's putting you in a better position or you're changing the way you know i don't know uh technology or tools or your setup or mentally or practice or not practice or like is there anything you're doing this year or a few things that you're changing up. Uh, yeah, I guess a little bit. So I'm always trying to adapt with technology. I'm always trying to push that curve. I think it's, I think it's huge, um, especially for the way I like to fish, which is I do a lot of finesse fishing and I do a lot of offshore fishing, whether it's finesse or not. Um, but anytime you're offshore, the more you can know about your surroundings, the better. So uh, I spent Spent a lot of time on LiveScope and uh, recently added a Mega 360 last year. And so I'm learning more about that and yeah, basically trying to push LiveScope to the absolute maximum. Um, 
there's so many different things you can do with it. I'm just getting into perspective mode. It hasn't really been a big thing for me in the past, but I'm seeing some benefits to that. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, technology wise, that's kind of what's going on. And then uh, in general, I'm, I'm kind of doing my normal thing, except, uh, except pushing myself even harder to just work harder and spend more time on the water. Um, every, every weekday I'm getting out after work and putting in a hour or two after work on the water. So I'm down in Florida, like I said earlier right now. And so like tonight I went out and caught a few and just tried to learn as much as possible. And, um, and then, uh, I guess the other thing I'm doing is trying to stay fit more. Um, I'm 38, so I'm kind of getting, getting aged, uh, I'm, I'm still kind of in that prime age on the elite series. I think I'm right around the median age. Um, so I feel good about that, but I do want to try and stay healthy as long as possible. Cause if I, if I do make it, I want to have a, have a long, nice, long, healthy career. So I, yeah, that's kind of the main things. So there's like these little like evening workout trips. Do you go out with like intent? Like, is it tonight is like drop shot night? Tonight is like perspective mode night. Tonight is like shallow flipping. Like what, what kind of things are you working on or what, what kind of goals do you give yourselves on these little one to two hour excursions? Yeah, that's a hundred percent it. And then two, like it's a technology thing. Like, so I'll, I'll make a little tweak with how my live scope transducer is positioned on my trolling motor and I'll, I'll go and experiment with that. So it's, it's experimentation and um trying trying some new techniques and sometimes it's just i want to feel a bass bite so i'll put a drop shot in my hand and go catch one but uh it's it's just trying to stay sharp and get in the rhythm of going out on the water and you know trying to figure out how to position yourself to catch a fish sure are you still a single uh forward facing sonar transducer and screen at this point or do you got multiple I'm still I'm still a single live scope and then a 360. So whether you consider that forward facing or not, but I I use it to get the landscape and line up targets. Um, so like I'll I'll see something I want to aim my live scope at on 360, and I I think they work in harmony like super well. So I don't have. I don't have a dedicated perspective mode screen yet. I have three on the front of my bass cat, which, you know, bass cat is fairly narrow in the front. So it's already a lot of stuff going on up there, but uh, sure. I did see Tristan McCormick, I think had four on the front last year. And I'll be curious to see how many guys go that way. Yeah. You're, it's starting to become more common. Well, there's a couple of things that I'm starting to see is one, they basically have one dedicated to regular and one dedicated to perspective, or they've got one on the trolling motor and one on a, a, a manual, like a crappie turret. Type mount turret. <clears throat> um, and then the other thing I'm starting to see is people having like a little <clears throat> turret on like a gimbal. I forget what those, the, uh, Kong mount type thing, uh, mm -hmm. like right by the council that they'll drop down and then they'll idle with live sonar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a few guys putting them on the back too, um, on the transom, and they run them like a side scan transducer. It works well on rock lakes, from what I've heard. I I don't have that set up personally, but uh, um, yeah, you're you're starting to see that. I. I've seen what you're talking about. I've seen in a walleye application for, um, for trolling. And that, that looks super sick. Like they're, they're watching their bait back there. They're making sure it's at the, at the right depth and they can watch the fish come up to it and see how they react. So yeah, that's, uh, there's a lot of different things you can do with it. Yeah. I, what I've heard more is people like basically have a turret, like right by the shifter and they're like panning around on top of their side imaging and like looking for you know things fish probably more fish than anything or bait at that point <clears throat> that stuff that's maybe a little easier to see on live than in uh you know like rocks and brush and that kind of stuff are probably gonna look even easier on but so that's 
I think we're only, unfortunately, maybe only scratching the surface of live sonar at this point. Yeah, the thing I like about that too is um, like in these 225 plus boat tournaments, you, you need to be stealthy too. Like you definitely don't want to catch a fish in front of anybody, but even standing up on a spot and like make it known that there's something worth looking at there uh, can, can give a, can give a good spot away. And so to, to just slow down your idle and flip your turret over, like maybe most people wouldn't notice you doing that and get away with looking around at a spot more closely without having to stand up on your front deck. I, I think that's pretty smart. Matt, EQ is uh, the elite qualifiers, so that's what they've termed, I guess, the point system for the anglers, the 175 anglers that are fishing all nine Bassmaster Opens, and what you are now required to do to make the Bassmaster Elites. Hopefully that answers your... Uh... Yeah, we've heard uh, rumors about 360 Live. I have, I don't know. I haven't heard anything like... I don't believe it's like coming out this year at iCast or the Classic or anything. I think it's a little ways out from the sounds of it. Um, I think we're more likely to see a, a, a brushless Ultrax before we see a live 360 at this point. <clears throat> but Yeah, I, I, I don't have any insight on that either. I, I'm not sponsored by any of the three main companies. I run all three on my boat. Um, so I'm paying retail just like everybody else. And I... I haven't heard any any updates. I've obviously heard the rumors that it will come out at some at some time, but uh, I guess like from my perspective, pun intended, perspective mode is pretty dang close to a 360 uh, live. You just maybe only get 180, but yeah. uh, you're manually controlling it versus it just kind of constantly spinning. Yeah, um, and I I. I run my 360 on kind of the front view too. So I'm not really seeing much behind my boat. I feel like I'm normally moving down a path. And so I've already seen what would be behind me unless I'm missing a fish, but I'm panning around on live scope enough that if there is something that obvious, I think I'd pick up on it. Yeah, so what is your, I guess, walk us through your, like, what do you have at the console? What do you have at the bow? Like, how do you set it up and break it down? Yeah, so at the console, I've got two Lorenz HDS 12s, uh, one I run dedicated on maps. I like the idea of having a Humminbird and a Lorenz at the console. Um, I tried a Helix at, and a HDS 12 at the console and just didn't like the user functionality of the helix um i think i should probably try a solix or an apex or something like that at the console because i i feel like i do too much clicking around to not have a touch screen and i'm so used to having a touch screen with the with the hds that like waypoint management and zooming in on things and uh moving around on a map and that type of thing was just uh it didn't fit well for me um, I think the Lake Master mapping is beautiful, though. I wish I wish I could get used to it so that I could have that. Although I, I don't think I'd like paying 150 bucks every time I went to a different state or region or whatever um, for the mapping card. But it's kind of a trade off. But anyway, so I so I run dedicated mapping on basically on my uh, uh, port side screen and then on my starboard. That's where all my magic happens. So it's. Uh, side scan down on the bottom screen and then i run down scan 2d sonar and sometimes another small uh map on that screen too just to to have a point of reference and then so that's kind of where I, that's that's where i spend most of my time and then when i do actually get to go fishing i go up to the front and i've got a garmin on top and then a helix 10 and a lorance hds 12 all on the front and um i'm using the garmin for live scope the hummingbird 100 percent dedicated for a 360 never even touch it don't even mess with contrast much or anything and then the lorance i use for 2d and mapping 
So, so what, that's what size, or what Garmin or which size Garmin are you running? Uh, I'm running the Garmin 1222 GPS map. And uh, so far, I, I really like like it. I had a 93 SV, which is really good bang for the buck, and 100% would still recommend that unit. Um, I wanted to get a little bit bigger screen just so I can pick up on my bait a little better. I feel like you can, I mean, maybe my eyes are getting old or something, or maybe it's because I'm six foot five inches away from the screen or whatever, but uh, I I got the 12 um, kind of for that reason, and, and I really like it. It's, um, it's a non-touch version. I don't miss the touch too much. It's got a nice knob to adjust uh, gain and the depth and stuff like that. The thing I do like about not having a touch up there is uh, so often you'll you'll have water drop off from your lure or you'll get a little splash over the front or whatever, and, it, and that can kind of screw up the touch screen. So, so it is kind of nice. Um, just kind of have old school non-touch screen. Um, but yeah, GPS, GPS map, 1222. Nice. Right, cool. You might be surprised that... Uh... I have two Helix 10s at the council. And then up front, I have Helix 12 that I run 360 and then just like a sliver of sonar map. And then uh, a 1022 on top of that. That's pretty impressive. I'm surprised <clears throat> surprised you went that far with it. With the 34 even. I assume you have the 34. I do, yeah. Yeah. So I didn't I, to be honest, so I didn't get the Garmin installed until mid September. So So you're just trying to get used to it still. Yeah. Basically I only had one day, <clears throat> the last day of the year, where I was uh fishing Marion and uh jerk baits in like the milfoil coontail clumps that were still standing and pulling them out of there, which was pretty impressive. That was I, I would have not caught nearly the amount of fish I did that day without it for sure like yeah there's so many cool things about it like in your scenario there just being able to see the way the fish react and the way they come out of the the grass like that i i think is so valuable to to stay confident with that technique and um you know it, it either gives you confidence or it makes you want to switch lures or try something else yeah it was a pretty so like i was seeing fish like follow me slow rolling uh, a bladed jig. Like I'd see them peek their heads out of the grass and then like, and I, and I'd throw my jig back. Couldn't get them to react to that. So I was like, I'm going to try a jerk bait, right? It's like November 13th. Water's pretty cold. Um, and uh, make a few casts with a 110. And I'm like, just seeing my jerk bait and I'm seeing how high it is above the grass that's still there. And I'm like, I don't think they're going to come up that far. So I made like three casts and I knew I was like, I need to go to a plus one. I went to a rearrange MR. And literally the next cast, I caught a pike that I saw eat it by getting it down. I could just see it coming. And all of a sudden, I was catching pass and pike. And then, like, just being able to see, like, a, something move. And you're like, all right, I'll let it sit there. Right. Or, like, and you just, like, it makes you so much more efficient for certain techniques. So, even pike are fun on live scope until they're not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess what that that made me think of one thing with with the LVS 34. I feel like I can see so much better through grass. Like I can I can see fish moving around in fairly heavy milfoil. Like it's pretty amazing. Um, I I've used Active Target and whatever they called the Lawrence one prior to that. And I honestly think Active Target is probably a little bit better when you're on a non grass lake. But anytime you get around grass, I feel like the Garmin just sees through grass so much better. And um, and I like I like how many different things you can change with Garmin too. So you, you can adjust a lot more settings with Lawrence. You basically only have contrast and um, it's nice to play around with some different things depending on what type of water you're in. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, we've got a few questions I want to catch up on here. Let's see here. Uh, West Coast Hunter, 745 versus 746. I'm assuming we're talking Dobbins, half ounce jig. I mean, if money's no object, I would go 755. 
but I think you could also go with an XP 744 or an Extreme 745 and still get everything you need for pitching jigs and Texas rigs. Um, Scott, I am not personally selling these hoodies. I don't know if Amy's still on or not, but she, Amy, uh, she sent me this. So I think you could look up the print craft or send a DM to tackle craft on our or, uh, Instagram. And they would probably, uh, hook you up with one of these. Um, we did see somebody from Arsenal peeking in. What's up guys. Uh, let's see here. What other, um, yeah. So same thing on the hoodies. So these aren't, this isn't my merch. It's something I need to work on. But uh, yeah, you got to talk to Amy if she's still on. She can let you know in the comments. Uh, facial hair does not make you better at fishing, but it makes you better at catching. Yeah, it's less sunscreen to put on too. It's an efficiency thing. <clears throat> and then this time of year, when you're you know on November thirteenth or January cold front in Florida, it's uh, less you know you don't have to have your neck buff up as high because your face stays warm. Um, yeah, so I think somebody answered this in the chat. Spinning the hub means that you're spinning out the hub on your prop, and basically it's designed that way so that you will not – the hub, if you hit something with your prop, that it will spin the hub versus taking out your lower unit is basically the design. So that's what that means. It's like like the same concept as a shear pin kind of thing. Yeah, it's like the shear pin on your trolling motor, but it's a – rubber although the new ones aren't exactly that same way i don't um uh, merc merc never really had or at least with a pro xs you could not spin a hub if you yeah. spun your hub you you ruined your lower unit but on a yamaha they they have the rubberized insert hub and uh that's a lot of times what what you'll hear when people spinning a hub but my, my EFI, he definitely could, like those, I don't know at what point Mercury switched to that new cell hub, but there was definitely, a, yeah, that was a thing. Um, I don't know. They could be interesting. The only thing about a giant screen versus multiple screens, I know one of the reasons that I run two tens instead of like a 12 or a 16 is redundancy. Um, in a pinch, if for some reason a unit goes dead, just something freak happens i can because everything's ethernet and ported and all that kind of stuff i can basically do everything on either one of them uh, or with a couple quick cable disconnects i can get by um so that would be the only downside of a one giant screen up front and one giant screen in the back would be that if you lose it you lose everything but 100 percent agree that's uh that's a huge thing especially especially doing uh tournaments across country like this like you you can't have enough spare stuff with you just because nature of the beast is we break stuff and uh -huh. um it's not it's so so reassuring to have like an extra 12 inch unit that i use on my left side for mapping but i could put that in any of the other positions to do whatever i need it to or if you're you're you know you if you're front uh, Lawrence went out, you could steal one from the dash in a pinch and just throw yep. it up there and get by. Yep, um, for sure. Get... The, the big screens, too, suck a lot of energy, and that's one thing that we're running up against, too, is having enough battery capacity to power all these screens. So, yeah, I mean, you can configure your graphs. You can leave one off if you think you're going to be using too much power or whatever, but if you have just two big ones um you wouldn't have that option mm -hmm. yeah i think that you know part of what the natural what we're just talking about like the yeah, dealers uh companies you trust that you can work with that have good warranty i mean it could be ones that you have official relationships with that's even or just working with brands or even when you say buying spending your own money you know a lot of times picking brands that you feel comfortable with that have the most service centers or have good warranty or good customer service. That's all important. All thing to consider uh, when you're trying to make a living or like when you have a lot of money on the line that you can get something to, to get you by, or they're going to support you for sure. Uh, 
Right, yeah, it's a it's a huge deal. At, at the opens, they've got service trailers where we can bring our boats, and hopefully they'll have uh, parts to help get you fixed up if you have anything go wrong, um, including trolling motors and units and motors and whatever. And uh, so you definitely want to be friendly with those guys. I I try and bring them donuts and everything everything I can to get in their good graces. So. Preston's checking in. <laughs> I wouldn't. Uh, I can't answer it. I don't know. I yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> Is asking for a friend. <laughs> um. Yeah. I know that is true. That the new Gen Two Active Target. I have not seen it in person. I don't know if you've got any buddies or anybody you run with down there that you've seen it yet in person. I have not. No. I'm. I've only seen just kind of the same stock photos that everybody else has. So I'm excited to see what it is too. see how it, how it uh, performs any differently than the current one. Mm -hmm. I mean, so is it like, is it going to be like up to the 34 or is it just going to catch up to like the 32 or like, it'd be interesting to see how it pans out. Yeah. Well, I, I think the biggest gonna exceed, thing, I don't know, like, <clears throat> I think the biggest thing they could do is a software update to give you more options. Yeah, Preston, he did touch on this. I don't know if you were on, but uh, I've noticed that my little experience, I can definitely, you don't necessarily always can tell what it is, or but you can definitely see movement in the grass for sure. Uh, yeah, you can. And um, so I guess a couple of tips with that is if you're trying to accomplish this, go to a place where you're out of the wind for one, because that that kind of eliminates other things moving around in the grass. And then uh, I like to turn my gain down. So I'll, I'll actually turn it down to a point where I can just barely see my lure splash mm. or maybe not even see my lure at all. I do like to still see it just so I have a frame of reference where I'm pitching to. Um, but then I turn color gain up and color gain is kind of interesting. It, makes hard things brighter so your your grass will get a little bit brighter but it'll really make the the fish that are in the grass really pop a, a little better and um so between those two things um i don't really mess with any other settings and the lvs 34 was like the biggest change that i noticed was being able to see in the grass better the 32 is really really good it's definitely um you don't need to upgrade if you already have the 32. I just feel like the 34 is just a just a touch better. I've heard like that bot target separation on the bottom. I never ran a 32, but people said that they they could pick up more fish or baits closer to the bottom, <clears throat> which would make sense about the grass too. Just getting that target separation. Yeah. Um, I think a. Th that the power pole trolling motor will launch either at the classic or ICAST this year. I think it's actually going to happen this year from the sounds of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about that one. I'm, I'm interested to see what that does with a lot of uh, pro relationships too. Cause I know there's a lot of guys that are running power poles and some other type of graphs, Lawrence and Garmin come to mind. So mm -hmm. Um, now that everybody has a trolling motor, it'll be kind of interesting to see who's still sponsored where. Right. Do, uh, do co-anglers ever affect how you fish in the open? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so um, when they're not catching anything, I don't think it really affects me too much unless they're casting in front of the boat or something like that. But for the most part, like I usually just try and have a good time with them and hopefully they're catching them, but not catching fish that I wish I would have caught <laughs> kind of thing. But if they are, if they are catching fish and they're catching meaningful fish, like I'll change up. I'm not too proud. Um, yeah. I can think of several examples where 
somebody was throwing something a little bit different than I was, which is what you're supposed to do as a co-angler. And uh, it was working better than whatever I was doing. And, um, you know, because it's so conditional and you practice for several days. If it's, if it's a little bit different conditions, there might be a, a lure that works better on the day that you go back there. But I don't know about you, Rich, but it's, if I if I get a bite in practice, like I normally go back to that spot with that bait in mind. It's just it's hard for us to get that out of our heads that um, you know there might be a better technique on that given day. So yeah, you know, a lot of times that kind of gives you confidence that something else might work. It's an easy trap for sure. I know I can think of one time that I intentionally didn't, and it was actually fishing with Dan on Big Stone. All the all the practice days, hot sun, calm, and I was throwing like a frog, like up super shallow. And the tournament day was rainy and windy and overcast. And I started the day with a chatterbait instead, and it immediately paid off. Uh, and obviously, thinking back, it was the obvious decision, but it's not always obvious when you've been getting bites on something for five days in a row. Like you get that blind to the conditions and fishing the moment sometimes and yeah you know, can put you off to your blindness a lot of times yep exactly yep <laughs> johnny is like tagging everybody and their brother and, uh... <laughs> what's up johnny <laughs> awesome keep it up yeah um, I guess I do, I do want, want to forget to uh, make sure we do thank Arsenal Fishing for supporting the channel and the stream. Uh, as always, you can uh, check out Arsenal Fishing and use code Halibats15 down below. Um, what, so just, uh, what, what is your favorite Arsenal bait in specifics? Like, what's your favorite bait color and your favorite way to fish it? Uh, it's, pr it's probably got to be the tack. Tack minnow. I always call it a tack swimmer. I don't. I think I've got the name wrong, but tack minnow. I, I like the. Uh, I like the. Now you're making me pick a favorite. I. I like the three point five, mm -hmm. and I like the. White that's kind of translucent. Is that the flashbang white? I think so. It's so I think it's got like the hard flex in it. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the one you cut the snook on. Yeah. But anyway, I use so I use that on a drop shot, and I'll Texas kind of Texas rig it on a drop shot and swim that through grass, and that's that's a pretty deadly technique in the north. Um, it's uh, it's a way to to yeah flashbang white. Thank you, and uh, it's a way to cover a little bit of ground on the drop shot instead of just pitching it into one place, shaking it and reeling it up like you can actually yeah. cast what? it out and. Retrieve what it a little. Are, what hook are you using a Texas rig that drop shot that little? I've, I've played around with a few, but I ultimately end up going back to like a two watt EWG style. Hmm. So it's a fairly small hook, which I like on a drop shot. So it's just a regular um, sort of thinner wire EWG. It wouldn't you wouldn't want like a heavy duty one because because I'm using spinning tackle to do it and. Um, but that that hook ends up being really weedless and uh that setup is just awesome like you can pitch it right into a clump of grass and not get hung up but then two i love that uh as a spinnerbait trailer too that same that same tack tack minnow uh as a, as a spinnerbait trailer and then as a chatterbait trailer i usually go with a 4.5 though so I feel like the action is just a little bit better with a little bit longer, a uh, little bit longer bait. But that three point five is perfect on a spinner bait, and I've been throwing that a lot lately. Yeah, I've I've thrown it a lot on the uh, the Bassman Compact, that little three and a half That's inch. Same same bait I've been using lately. I love that thing. Um, and then yeah, I throw a lot of four and a half inch on the the uh, the chatter baits, and I will throw a three and a half inch a lot if I know I'm majority targeting smallies on a chatterbait i'll trim it up a little bit trim the skirt up and just profile a little bit um but i don't i've not tried drop shotting like that so that'll be something to um let's see here uh johnny you need a new soft frog why is green not the best because black is the best so you only need a black and a white <laughs> 
Because yeah, your green I, frog I, probably has a white bottom, and they're not looking at the green top, Johnny. Yeah, the the black makes for a good contrast, is what I always thought. That's that's why I think a lot of people like the black frogs, and they can so like a lot of times you're throwing a soft frog around super heavy cover, and um, part of what you're trying to do is get them to be able to see where it is because. I know a lot of times frog fishing, you'll have fish that completely miss it. And a lot of times those are pike, but sometimes it's bass too. And I uh, feel like if you can give them a better target with um, giving them more contrast with a black frog, um, that, you'll, that you'll have better success. You got a black frog in there? I'm sure I do somewhere. But I did have a date when I was changing colors, but it wasn't this one unleash actually you fished this tournament <clears throat> i did in, in a borrowed boat that was a whole other story but <laughs> i was throwing a black frog and i think it was the second morning and i had like three in a row miss my black frog and i went to this one and they choked it the rest of the day so sometimes subtle color changes can make a difference in whether a a fish commits to a bait and that can be with a top water that can be the frog that could be a, a spinner blade a blade of jig like a lot of times it's really simple like dark light but other times small tweaks can be the difference in them committing so it, it's i don't know you just gotta be listening to the fish right like <laughs> if you're catching a lot of fish like crank baits on the rear hook or they're catching them on the outside of the mouth or things like that that could be a uh, an idea that you might need to tweak it and that's really wholesale change but a small tweak might create uh, big big peaks and improvement hmm. it's not true I'm pretty picky about my frogs I don't I don't stray too far from the truth um. <laughs> All right. didn't you used to be a big Terminator frog guy I kind of liked them I mean I had a, a I felt like my hookups were pretty good with Terminators, but I feel like their weights came out really easy. Like the, and uh, they were pretty economical, but now I feel like they've also come up in price. I don't know. I've, I don't dislike the Terminators, but they're not in my like my top rotation anymore. Um, you got the furry frog, the Rumbanus one. Uh, I've tried the Stanford frog with the little. I'm be honest that one is not anywhere like that's a that's a mississippi river pike pre-fish and don't care if a pike eats it frog for me like i don't feel like the hookups are very good on that which is is weird because you'd think if boom boom puts his name on it and it would be legit and i for me and my mechanics and my hook sets and like my setup it's not the deal maybe the deal for other people for me it hasn't been the deal um Yeah, I've, I've actually warmed more up to spro frogs recently. I was kind of like, eh, spro frogs are ordinary, but I've I've come to to appreciate them more. Um, do you uh, South Jersey always likes to talk about big baits? Uh, have you dabbled with big baits in your live scope? I just started. I um, kind of was inspired by Milliken Fishing, who. Uh, <laughs> Kind of, uh, I don't know. I don't know if most people, I don't know what most people think about him. He seems maybe like he might be a little controversial, but he has some pretty good stuff out there. And uh, his live scope videos are pretty amazing. Like if you, if you want to learn live scope, like don't mean to be a salesman for milk and fishing, but he's got some pretty good stuff out there. And so sort of inspired by that, um, I started throwing around a, uh the single only glide bait that i have in my boat which is an arashi one and uh played around with it on live scope and um i haven't spent enough time with it to really know but uh it was fun it shows up really nice i mean you won't have a problem with that you'll be able to see it on your screen really easily and the, I, I love the concept about it because it's sort of a suspending bait like it, um, 
a glide bait anyway. I, I know there's different rates of fall with different swim baits and stuff, but uh, you can, that's kind of the trick I feel like with live scope is to keep the bait at the level, whatever the fish are at. Um, so, you know, jerk bait's a big one and this glide bait, I think will play. I'm, I'm curious to see um, some smaller options of a glide bait. Cause I feel like those bigger ones are situational and, they only work around certain forages and stuff, but uh, yeah, I, I think there's going to be more opportunities with glide baits specifically as far as big baits. Um, it's interesting to see how they react to it for sure. Yeah, I think it definitely having live scope with big swim baits and glide baits can shorten your learning curve with big baits. I know uh, Ben, just listening to him, he's he really likes the extremes. He likes to like eight to ten inches, or he's like throwing a two point eight. Like he doesn't spend a lot of time in the middle, which is interesting. And obviously, we'll see how that pans out on the opens and the EQs because he'll be he'll be rubbing rails with with old Ben here all season long. Um, and actually, I I, I want to have Ben on. Uh, he just been on so many shows recently after the announcement. I think I was going to try to get him on, like maybe like I, I don't know, I've looked at the schedule, but I assume there's a break in there somewhere. It might be fun to have him on after he's like three, four tournaments in, and and then get like, what do we really think? Good, bad, ugly, uh, and I think he would share his his honest opinion. So I think that would be cool. Um, yeah, I I kind of I don't know much about him. I just started watching his stuff recently, but from what I can tell, it seems like I think it'll be good. He, he likes to do things differently and he seems to like to do things his way. And that's a big deal in the opens. I think like not, not buying into doc talk and going to do what everybody else is doing is probably some of the best advice you can give somebody fishing the open. So. All right. Let's see. Two muscle baits after the ice disappears. Have you ever done any really early, Iowa. I think Chris is in Iowa. You spent you spent a little time in Iowa. You got any? What's what's your best early ice ice out Iowa baits? Um, probably go with a jerk bait for sure. And then uh, I guess I don't know. I I'm probably the wrong guy to ask. I don't have a ton of like cold spring experience. Um, but a jerk bait for sure. And then I don't know. I feel like a chatterbait is kind of hard to beat any time of the year. Yeah. Um, true ice out. If you've got any shallow bays in the lake or reservoir you're fishing, I find that like right after ice out, you go throw a swim jig in literally water where you think <laughs> the bass's backs will be out of the water in these shallow bays and they're going to be in there. Um, there seems like there's like a mad rush right after ice out to get super shallow and you'll be catch some good numbers and surprisingly big bass, um, just creeping us a, a light swim jig. Uh, yeah. They get in that carp water where it's just carp for the rest of the year. Basically those muck bottom bays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. What you, I know what you mean. Typically that is not legal in Minnesota, but I believe like Iowa doesn't have a season. So you should be able to, Roll right in there and cave their faces in. Um, all right. Three bait techniques you never leave home without. And then three, or I guess maybe not three, three baits you never leave home without. And then maybe what are you looking forward to get better at in this upcoming season? Um, three that I never leave at home. Uh, definitely a drop shot. <laughs> um drop shot, I, I would, shot and a drop shot <laughs> yeah i would say three drop shots a, no a, a chatterbait for sure and then um uh, probably texas rig i don't know if you can count that as one bait but i'll go with a flipping style texas rig so those are my my three i never leave home without and then uh what i want to get better at this year um I'll probably go mm, square bills. Not, not the best square bill fisherman. I'd like to get better at it. Um, 
feel like I've thrown it way more now that I've fished more across the country than I did back when I was at home. Uh, but I do think it has its place in Minnesota for sure too. And um, I'm always looking to get better at a lipless crankbait. I, I love throwing it in Florida. I don't know all the applications for it. Other places, I think it's kind of mostly a colder water bait, but I uh, want to get better at that one. And then um, maybe a glide bait. Maybe I'll throw the big baits on there. I say every year I'm going to get better at the big baits and then making videos and tournaments come around and that thing goes right in the bottom of the compartment. <clears throat> yeah. It's not, yeah, it's a, I think it's situational for a tournament, but it's not like the highest percentage <laughs> technique and uh, a lot of times especially fishing the opens you just need you just need to get some legals in the boat yeah if you hadn't gathered this big bass or bass of big malone that uh, when when hard pressed to put a fish in the boat kent's gonna have a drop shot in his hand most of the time yeah yeah pretty much i mean there's there's been a few situations where i don't have confidence in it like at the upper chest peak i could not buy a drop shot bite for whatever reason um my finesse presentation there turned into a weighted wacky rig which i guess you could call a nico but um yeah so between those probably between those two a wacky rig and a drop shot very nice nick i got two of those i think you're gonna like that rod uh, let's see here. Tips for tourney as a boater. So maybe like first, I'm assuming just getting into tourneys as a boater, first tourneys, like what are some, it's, it's kind of a, you go a long ways on that. I'm trying to think about like, yeah, I, I think <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. So I'll just give a few few of the things that I like to do is do some research beforehand. So I like to use Google Earth and um, whatever type of mapping that you like. I like Navionics. They've got a pretty good online free um, web app that you can go to and do a little bit of map research. And then um, so that you feel a little more prepared when you get to the lake, just as far as where the structure is and how the lake sort of sets up. Um, I guess you can, if you want, read or try and watch videos on the baits. I don't think that's as important. I think it's better to just go and do your own thing. Um, and then uh, spend as much time as you can with your electronics. Uh, so as a boater, like assuming you have at least mapping in 2D, hopefully side scan too. Um, you know, if if it's a time of the year where you think offshore is going to play, you know, um, spend some time looking around on side scan. If it's spring or if you're the type of person that doesn't really like to fish offshore, just see as much as a, of the lake as you can ahead of time, um, just so you know where things are. So if something starts to click and you're like, oh, they're biting on docks that are next to a steep drop off or something like that. Then you kind of know the other places you can run to um, during the tournament. And then uh, another big thing I would say is try and limit the number of catches that you have, depending on where you are. Um, Minnesota is kind of nice to where you can, you can kind of check size on your schools and, and catch a few and not really feel like you just um, may have ruined uh, a valuable fish um so i guess a, a few things that i do is i'll use um either cutoff hooks or hitchhikers which is just like basically a screw in um to keep your bait on the line it, uh, like a soft plastic bait on the line without having a hook and um and then just see where you get bites and uh keep track of that with your waypoints come back there in the tournament and actually set the hook on the fish that are biting in that area without having to burn one of those fish because a lot of times when you hook one, it's not going to bite for several days afterwards. Um, so, but one that did just chew on your soft plastic, I, I think has a lot more likelihood to bite your presentation again. 
Yeah, I know. Uh, it kind of depends on where I'm fishing, but like going down the Wachita River two years ago now, um, I uh, crank baits are tricky. You know, about the only thing you can do on a treble hook bait is roll them all in. Like, um, but I threw a lot of spinner baits and chatter baits where I would. <clears throat> there's two things that I've found effective. If like when you're if you're wiring your boat, if you save all those strippings off the copper wire, they make really good like hook covers. Um, yeah. Like, and you can kind of lean on a fish and hold them a little bit and they'll usually like come up and pop off on a spinner bait or something like that. Um, and the other thing that works really good is just little pieces of shrink tubing. You just kind of let it hang over and then but then again at the same time, the shrink tubing, if you want to and you really like you can still hook them. <laughs> you can push through it. But that's the kind of stuff uh, I don't I'm not a big fan of like taking a jackhammer and cutting the tip off of it to not hook fish. It gets kind of expensive. Um so yeah, I, I definitely keep keep my rusty hook baits and use those yeah. for practice and then keep the fresh ones that I haven't used yet or that are in really good shape, keep those for the tournaments. So but yeah, I I I like I like I like those ideas too. Yeah, I, I I like every time I go like every time I rig for a tournament, all those hooks that I cut off that were like my practice hooks or my fun fishing hooks, I throw those in a box with the the tag still on them. And then when I go f- practice fishing, I it's what I tie on, and they're typically dull. They typically got a rolled point. They typically right are not great. And they're probably good enough for most fun fishing, but then I also don't care if I like want to roll it over or cut the tip off or, you know, I don't feel bad because I already know that like I've already used that hooks, but like just, we, you never, I, I, it's odd at how many people I'll see like getting ready to go practice a tournament and they take a fresh Gamagatsu out of a brand new pack and then like take a pliers to it or cut the tip off. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, yeah, I'm the same way. I've got, I've got a separate kind of rusty beat up hook uh used hook box and then it's all freshies for the tournament yeah but, uh, yeah i think telescoping mounts are pretty i don't know if they're the next big thing but there's a lot of people that are leveraging them you've seen like those balls out shorty mounts telescoping um yeah, that's what I'm running. I've got a beat down in it. I've got the ultimate shorty. And the um, thing I like about the ultimate shorty is it doesn't, it's not as tall as the ultimate not shorty, but you do have the option to make it as tall. So it's um, it's basically almost like a seat pedestal that, it's, that the graphs can slide up and down on. And then at the top, it's threat. It's like threaded pipe where you could connect another section of pedestal, and now you can slide your graph another eighteen inches higher. Um, I like it. I uh, yeah, yeah. I I I don't know if it's a direction of how things are going to go or not. It's it's tall. I mean, it's really yeah. up there. Yeah. And it can make visibility a little bit tough. Now, the nice thing about it is you can obviously put your grass back down. And in a bass cat, you can you can put it all the way down. Um, bass cats have like this recessed foot pedal area that kind of extends over to where your graphs are mounted. And um, if you get the the shorty, it will fit down in that recess area, which is pretty nice. But yeah, I think I saw um, Ron Mayer last year. Did you see his setup? Mm-mm. He had, it looked like multiple ram mounts connected together. Well, it was like articulating like a like a snake mount almost. Like a, yeah, yeah, and it, it ended up being really tall. And I, I thought that was a pretty interesting it idea. Like, this. like, it, like you could like... Well, he could fold it down, which is a big deal when you're going to go across big water. You know, you don't want you don't want to have your thousands of dollars of electronics hung up in the air like that. So, um, yeah, it, people are coming up with some pretty creative stuff. And I, you know, the 
the uh, staring down at the graphs is hard on the body. I definitely feel it in my neck. And, um, you know, the, it's, yeah, it's, it's a tough deal. I don't know what the right solution is. I think getting out, getting them up a little bit higher does help a little, but it doesn't change your viewing angle that much. So you're still looking down. Um, it'll be interesting to see what yeah, people come up with. Ron, though, he's so short. I don't know why he would need it higher. So I don't, it doesn't make any sense <laughs> to me. So. Actually, Ron uh, is fishing a Toyota on Rayburn today. I didn't, I didn't look to see how he did. Yeah, I didn't see the results yet either. Curious to see how that one went. That, that lake hasn't been really doing all that great um, weights-wise that I've seen lately. I don't know if you've seen any different, but there's always your 10, 11 pounder or whatever, maybe a couple 20 pound bags, but look like Harris Chain where I'm at right now kicked out some big sacks today. Nice. Co college tour is here and uh, college Bassmaster and 29 pounds is leading it. And it was 20 pounds all the way to 16th place. So that was, that's pretty that's good. Healthy. That's healthy fishery. Makes you wonder why you only caught 14 inches when you were out last Tuesday night and what you were doing. I've been only catching 14 inches basically every night. <laughs> but uh, I don't, yeah, I'm, a, I'm in Big Lake Harris. And um, Big Lake Harris right now has zero vegetation except in Party Cove which if you remember the elite series last year, uh, party cove was where it's where the party gosh, went down. at least 75% of the field was in there at one point during the day, I would say like it was, it was, it was a party. Um, so I think there's still fish in, in the cove, but, uh, they are very educated and not really excited about biting. So, um, you can still catch a few in there, but the rest of Lake Harris has zero hydrilla that I've found and just Kissimmee grass, and it's pretty dirty. So I would imagine most of these bigger bags and better sacks are probably probably not coming from Big Lake Harris, although last year um, the invita or Pro Circuit was here. And a lot of those guys did pretty dang good out of Lake Harris, and it was kind of a similar story. So hard to say, but uh, but I, if I was fishing a tournament, I definitely would be going to one of the other lakes. <laughs> Got a favorite jerk bait? Yeah, I'm a Vision 112, 110 guy. 112, 110 plus one or 110 plus two. I don't know any of those visions. I I have a lot of confidence in those baits. I think the action is pretty good and the the way they suspend is nice. I do also, I love the uh, Rapala Shadow Wraps. I'm huge on those. I, I like the deeps and the regular Shadow Wraps. Um, I like them for live scope because they sink slowly. And so then you can kind of manipulate your depth. So if you're seeing fish down in eight feet, you probably aren't going to get a vision 110 down there unless you add some suspend dots or wire to the hook or something like that. But with a shadow wrap out of the package, you can be patient with it and it will sink. And uh, you can, then you can start working it at any depth that you want to. So that's been a, that's been a really good live scope bait for me is wrap with a shadow wrap. Yeah. Supposedly the stunna is that way. I've not fished one, but I haven't either. But I've heard that. I like their stuff. old bait, the the cutter. I use, I actually use that. Pretty good success for smallmouth. It didn't look like much, but had good action. I've been a big fan of the re-range the last two years. <clears throat> I haven't tried one of those. Biggest knock is trying to get one and find them. They're always, you know, typical jackal Shimano supply chain problems. How are they for casting? They they outcast a one ten. They have a weight transfer system that when you throw it, it sounds like you snap your rod tip off every time you cast it. Okay. Like, like it's like crack. Like Yeah. Yeah, the 110, 110 is it's it's got the weight transfer system too, but it's kind of hard to cast. I I think the uh yeah, I don't know. 
I, I throw it on a spinning rod sometimes. <laughs> I know you're probably frown on that, but on a windy, on a windy day you. when when you need I to have control. Guy, but I cannot get used to the the yeah. For me, my my wrist gets wore out on one side, and I I reel with my left on a spinning rail, and reel with my right on a big caster. So it's nice to switch hands. So, so on, a, on a good jerk bait bite, I'll have both. Hmm. All right, back to drop shot. I think I know the answer to this, but uh... oh, it's changed on your edge. It's not. It's not a June bug trick worm anymore for favorite. Drop I, shot I love the June bug trick worm. It's uh, it's a fantastic bait. Still works great. Um, but I have switched to the Robo worm. Uh, mm. They they've got it a few more, a few different sizes and some colors that I think look pretty good. Um, I didn't realize it was going to be so controversial tonight. <laughs> they're nice and soft, and uh, you can you can stick a. I like the owner cover shot hook for largemouth fishing that I do around cover. And um, and I, I stick the hook point right in the center of, of the bait. I don't like go through it and try and text pose it or whatever, try and skin hook it. I just stick it right in the middle. And with a uh, robo worm, you'll get them every time with that thing. Have you, have you tried the, uh, the magic worms yet? Made by robo worm for missile? I haven't. Those look pretty sweet, though. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're really similar. They got a little different shape to them. They got kind of that, I don't know, those kind of reverse ribbings that you'd see on some of the, the missile baits. Um, Do they have a flat bottom? Yeah, they're, they're made by RoboWorms. They're, they're the same pouring technology. That, that's kind of one of the things that I like better about the RoboWorm versus... Yeah, that looks nice. Versus the trick worm is is having that flat side to it. I think that does give the tail and kind of give the bait a little more action when you're lifting it up and down. But don't sleep on that Arsenal tack minnow either. That's that's a pretty good trick. It's uh it's a good largemouth drop shot bait. There was a period of time that I was throwing that little Biovex. Colt tail, the colt tail, and I kind of like the way that I would feel, like when you lift, right? Very subtle. It almost felt like you were lifting like a little tiny blade bait or something. You just feel that little. Yeah. Do you get do you get that same thing on like a tack minnow? Not so uh, you do a little bit, yeah, and it's it's nice because yeah, because then you, it gives you confidence that your bait isn't fouled up or that you have grass hanging on it or something like that. Or it just gives you, like, if, if you're somebody that doesn't finesse fish a ton, right, and you're used to throwing spinner baits or chatter baits or crank baits where you get that, like, response, right, mm -hmm. it, it, it can give you, like, you feel a little more engaged. Because a lot of times a drop shot feels like you're not doing anything or you don't, you know what I mean? You, you don't. So if you're not used to doing that, like a net or a drop shot where you're getting no response, it's just kind of this empty glide of your bait down there. It can help you feel more engaged and give you more confidence, I think, when you're trying it as a new technique. Hmm. I like it. Yeah. So, Chad, you know, we probably, you know, if you get Ken started on drop shot theory and the whole thing, <laughs> we did actually, I think we, we talked at least an hour or two, and I think we spent 90% of it talking about drop shot last time. So, for those that really want like Kent's like deep theory on drop shot, you'll have to go back and search on the channel and there's another, like, I mean, we go deep on drop shot, small mouth. Like, like, I think you, I think uh, we won't go to deal, but I want to say you have three main drop shots, right? It's like a large mouth, uh, a sparse cover and a small mouth, or like a, I forget exactly what it is. You have like a couple main. Yeah. Drops. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Like, um, the sparse cover might be like the target casting one. So like, I'll, yeah, that's what it is. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, my smallmouth one will typically be like an open hook where I'm just casting the marks on my electronics. And then largemouth, um, basically Texas rig with, uh, you know, with a drop shot leader on it. And, and um, yeah, that, that, you, you basically got it right. 
Yeah, it was basically you had a, a largemouth weed drop set up, and then you had a target set up, and then kind of a fan casting set up. Yeah. 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 What's up, uh, Gabe? Tin Horse Mountie, good to see you. Let's see, man, we're at 90 minutes in almost, covering all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, spy baits. I can tell you I have very little opinion on spy baits because I've barely caught any fish at all on them. What are, what are your opinions, Kent? I'm sure you've thrown them more than I have. I know, like a Tuesday night adventure. I'm sure you've had a spy bait night or two. I have. I think they're pretty situational. Um, they're like a slick, calm, sunny bluebirds guy type of bait for me when nothing else is working. I'll experiment with it a little bit. Sometimes, some I, I don't know. They're, it's like one of the most fun bites you can get. Like they absolutely destroy the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, and for some reason, it seems like uh, big fish will eat it. Um, I like it. I I don't know. I I'd rather throw a small swim bait personally, just on a ball head. I got more confidence in it. <laughs> and uh, those tiny little treble hooks kind of scare the shit out of me too. I know. Uh... Did you win Pokegama? Yeah. Yeah. I all I I mean, I remember <laughs> more than you winning, I remember all the horror stories I heard from people talking about hooking and losing giant smallmouth on spy baits in that tournament. Yeah, it's a thing. It happens. It um yeah, I I don't know. I'm I've heard some people are are messing around with it more with live scope and it's got it. It's got its place with spotted bass too. Right. I know, and brush pile fishing, kind of that southeast uh, Lake Hartwell type of thing. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. It, it's not it's not big in my rotation. Yeah. Um, I, I like to say that I won the largemouth tournament because I think I was the highest finishing that caught ten green fish or weighed ten green fish in that <laughs> tournament. So. There you go. I think Dan got big bass, didn't he? Uh, he might have. But, yeah, we, uh, a bunch of us, a bunch of us here in the chat, all went to Gunnersville from there. Um, that's cool. So I guess maybe like uh, Rich asked this question a while ago. Uh, how'd you get started in fishing? First club, who took you? That kind of story. Yeah, uh, so started started fishing just at a at, at my grandparents' um, farm pond, and I knew that I loved fishing. I was super into the outdoors, um, mostly just fishing. I'm not a hunter really, but like doing sports and everything I could outside. Um, and I love fishing, and I uh, was dying for my own boat finally got one when I was 16. I was, I think, the only guy at Wyzetta High School that was pulling a boat to school and then going out after work. And uh, I just had like a little Lund with a six horse on it, but it was like, it was the world to me to be able to go out and be able to fish on basically anywhere that I wanted to. I spent a lot of time on Minnetonka and, um, didn't really, I mean, I liked fishing for anything. It wasn't necessarily bass to start with. It was whatever was biting and however I could catch them. I liked casting lures, so I was drawn to bass. I remember reading Bass in Magazine and kind of a lot of those, a lot of those old school magazines and getting as much information as I possibly could. And um, I wasn't ever really super excited by walleye fishing, so I guess that sort of trended me towards bass or pike and there wasn't really much going on with pike. So I got a little bit interested in, in bass fishing tournaments and I met, um, well, I didn't meet him. I, I knew of a guy at the church that I went to, uh, Mark Gomez, who um, introduced me to the club that he was a part of called Viking Bassmasters. And um, 
I had gone fishing with Mark once before he had the bass boat. He had a, at that time, a brand new 2002 Ranger, the same boat that he owns to this day, I think. And we went out. The small, what was he, like that tow vehicle? It was like a little compact. Yeah, it was an R, R90 or something like that. I don't remember. Um, but it was so but it, man that thing was fantastic it was like being on a dock anywhere you wanted to fish out, off of um across a whole lake it was it was just amazing i loved it i was hooked basically from that point i um he invited me to join the club i think i was maybe 19 or so and it, i i was like hey, i don't know i joined this club with all these old guys you know <laughs> and um but I eventually did and uh, started fishing with those guys. I think I was 20. And um, yeah, it was, uh, I was just, I was loving it from then on. I kind of cooled off. Like I, I was real excited about it at first. Um, didn't do super great my first year. Um, I think I got a second place or something. Then the next year I went out and got the club angler of the year. And then uh, from there, I sort of cooled off for a while and got more focused on my career and lost sight of tournament fishing a little bit. I was still I was still fishing the club and still going to TOC, but I wasn't ever doing great at TOCs, and I just I didn't I don't know, I didn't know how to get better. I guess. Is that during your treasury days? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. I was a treasurer for Bass Nation and. And then uh, a, a guy joined my club who was real competitive and he kind of pushed me to get better and kind of back and forth. And I don't know, we just pushed it to the limit, started fishing UMBCS team tournaments together and um, ended up doing pretty good at that. And things just started rolling and like I got more and more excited about it. And as I started to get a little bit better finishes and a couple of wins mixed in here and there, like I just it lit the fire and i i knew that's what i wanted to do and so that's what i've been pursuing ever since who who was your running mate in biking that was paycheck david pakachik all right yeah yeah and dave and i dave and i and a a friend of ours casey from the club traveled the opens as co-anglers back in 2018 and um yeah that's that was that was a great experience. I I would recommend it for anybody that's thinking about fishing bigger tournaments is to definitely start out on the coangler side just to see what it's like. See if you like being away from home for that long. You know that's a hard thing, and just kind of see what all travel entails because it's a lot more than just driving down there and you're good to go. Like there's so many mm-hmm. <laughs> little things that you have to deal with on the way and it's uh it's a lot but it's worth it in the end for sure yeah did you go did you go say hi to paycheck while you're down there in florida yeah we kind of lost touch i i saw him last uh last year at, at the elite series when they were here but uh mm-hmm. yeah, not, not so much anymore What's up, Jermaine? Uh, so you, you kind of touched on batteries. Uh, are you doing anything unique? Are you running AGMs, or how are you powering all those graphs and all that kind of stuff? What's your... Yeah, nothing super unique. Um, I am running two 36-volt lithiums, um, so that takes a battery position. So a basket, um, you can fit four in there kind of traditionally. I'm sure you can put some other batteries other places if you wanted to, but the traditional setup, you can fit four in the back compartment. So that that left one position open for me to run two AGMs in parallel. So I've got um, two AGM Pro Guides. Uh, they're like the, the, the biggest one, the Group 31 um in parallel and then i've got the 36 volt trolling motor batteries in parallel and then to your point earlier about redundancy that gives me redundancy both on my trolling motor side and on my graph side so that 
if, if one of those batteries does go bad, hopefully I notice it before too long because batteries in parallel will kind of affect each other. Um, so you do kind of have to keep tabs on that. But uh, right. if one does go out, then I still have the other one. And uh, it gives me amp hours enough to run everything in my boat all day long without having to wor worry about standby, which I find extremely irritating. So, um, yeah, I, I can't deal with having to put things in standby because I always forget or just bothers me. So, yeah, I, I like the, the two battery setup. Yeah, I got used to it when I was running the old Bass Cat <clears throat> life, you know. Mm -hmm. Stand by dimming screens, turning one off, like doesn't bother me so much, but I don't really need to anymore. But I am thinking about working some redundancy into my battery system this year. So, um, yeah. go ahead. Oh, uh, on the batteries or on this question? You can go back to batteries first <laughs> if you had something. Um, so I am a little bit curious about the 16 volt battery. Uh, so the, my 36 volts are, um, powerhouse lithium, which is the brand that offers a 16 volt. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't exactly know that I buy into the theory there, but the one thing that I do think is kind of smart about a lithium battery is that, um, like even a regular lithium 12 volt battery is 14 volts fully charged up. Mm -hmm. So by the time you get down to 12 volt, that battery is like toast, you know, like you, you're going from 14 volts down to maybe low, low 13s or high 12s or something like that. So, so you, I guess point being is that you're always in that volt range that your graphs are looking for. So whether or not having higher voltage actually makes your screen any cleaner, I think, I I'm not sure. Jury's out on that one for me. I haven't seen yeah. it firsthand. I, but. I, might, I might be testing it out this year. We'll see. I'm kind of intrigued. Like, um, Because I also think, like, <clears throat> right, even though you <clears throat> have whatever, if you're fully charged, but you're with an AGM, you're only ever fully charged at the start of the day. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right. Um, and then uh, you do have drawdown, right? Because like, even, like, my... I ran what 10 gauge home runs dedicated wires to my, you know, I kind of wired my own this, you know, for the Camus and you still have that little bit of stretch of like, you know, the, the small wire from your unit, but like, even when my chatters are fully charged, I'm not getting 14 when I turn my Garmin on in the morning. It's, you know what I mean? Like that you're, you're with that length and all that stuff you're losing. Right. So I don't know. I think there could be something to it. I guess time will tell, but, um, Yep. Um, yeah, I guess any tips for live scope and 360 and mounting and interference or anything you've run into or wise words? Yeah, so um, I've been playing around with this mount. It's called a Fish Obsessed. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them, but I've seen I've seen it on certain guys' boats that are really good with live scope. Uh, Scott Martin, Brian New. A few other guys, uh, Travis Moran was running one for a while. I don't know if he still is, but um, Fish Obsess mount gives you kind of infinite angle possibilities. So, so it's um, it's it's a mounting solution that you can put on your trolling motor shaft, and then you can kind of tilt it up or down or to the side and as much as you want to, and it makes it super easy for switching from perspective mode back to regular. Um, so I I am running their, yeah, I'm running their Dominator. And uh, that is what it looks like. And it, uh, it it's nice because with the 360, um, you run into issues of not being able to raise your motor very high. I think you had a problem with that, if I remember right, Rich. <laughs> Did wow. you? Uh, didn't you bang your? Didn't that, you bang that, your that, that was unrelated. That was oh, okay. poor, poor judgment of having it in the water in the Watchtower River. Oh, okay. Well, what can happen is um, 
like your your forward facing sonar when you lift the trolling motor up to to go in shallower water or whatever your forward facing sonar can hit your 360. Um, so what this thing allows you to do Gives you or one of the benefits is that you can just you can just tip it down and then still angle it up to whatever you need you know angle wise to get forward yeah, I see. and uh, get it out of the way or if you're not worried about going shallow or whatever you can just have it go straight out and then you, i think you get a little bit better reading when it's not tipped down by the motor the, fr the further you can get away from the trolling motor barrel itself um i think you get a little bit better reading for years i've had it just on the barrel of the trolling motor just kind of on there with a hose clamp um you know they make a amount for that too and and it works um you're kind of just like stuck at whatever that one direction and angle is you don't have the ability to switch over to perspective mode um when it's on that style amount and you're kind of at risk of banging it into a big rock and ruining the transducer which can be a 800 dollars mistake or whatever but or maybe even more than that now i don't even know um but yeah uh it, it's uh I, I like it it's um i like tinkering with the angle i think that's big for being able to see your bait is have it clicked up a little bit i think mm -hmm. you can definitely click it up too far um the stock position i don't think i can at least i can't see my bait hit the water very well so this thing allows you to really tinker with that and uh that's what i like about it the best yeah that's the first thing that you're talking about, like way about, so I can just barely see my bait and hit the water. And I was like, I think he's got his uh, angled up slightly. Like, yeah. And that's huge for live scoping. I think like, I don't know. It's, um, it's like seeing, seeing your bait is a big deal. And to be able to find where your bait is, is like easiest when you can see this, see the splash hit the water. Right. If you're if you're not seeing it right away, and then maybe it kind of comes in the cone once once it gets down a little ways, you may have gotten off of that angle, or the you know the wind blew you a little bit, or you, or you moved your foot a little bit, and it and it wasn't right in the right direction anymore. But pretty much, if you aim at your angle and you can see it splash, like that's going to be your best chance to stay with your bait the whole rest of the retrieve in. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I noticed that a little bit I was using. It was like it was like you feel like you'd work it 10, 20 feet before you'd like get it. Yeah. yeah. So Yeah, and you can I mean you can even if you if you have it right, you can even watch a top water go across the water with it when it's Pretty when it's well. angled up a little bit. Yeah. And see fish which, like. Yeah, which can be really, really fun. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of the same question, Bo. Like all these manufacturers talk about how important it is to get all this juice and have good connections, and then they have these sixteen gauge wires out of their graphs. It's like, and we're spending God knows what on these units, right? How much would it cost them to have twelve gauge wiring <laughs> instead of that like tiny stuff they have running out? Which is kind of, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't really either. The only thing I can think of is just the connector size. Like they're already pretty dang big to try and fit through the gunnels of a of a boat. So to try and minimize those, that would be my guess. But Typically yeah, they still I'd... have like right. They have like that like I don't know if it's a interference or a filter or whatever. Like almost all of them have like that freaking knob. That's that's the part that you can't get through. It's not the you know like yeah. Um, now the screens are supposed to be able to like they have different different units have different limits but they're they're most of them are run much hotter than 12 or 14 volts uh, but I don't know interesting but they also say that like over that short a distance on a short cable that it's not supposed to matter I don't know yeah, well, if if that question was in regards to the voltage, um, you, there are certain units where the tolerable range is much higher than 16 volts. I think Hummingbird, don't quote me on this, 
I think Hummingbird, you can run it without a voltage regulator, but I know the Rants, if you do get those 16 volt um, lithium batteries, you do need to run a voltage regulator, uh, which will take it down from that 16 down to whatever the Lowrance operating range is, which I think is less than 15. Um, So in your days, has uh, any of your co-anglers tried to uh, bring a portable live scope in your boat yet? <laughs> or have you I heard about it, it in the opens at all, like people you know? Or I've heard about it. I've not. I don't know that it's happened in the opens. It maybe has, not to my knowledge. I don't know anybody that it's happened in the opens, but I have heard about that, and uh, no, it it hasn't happened to me yet. <laughs> I'm. I mean, with two hundred boats. For the last two years, there's had to have been going looks in the opens. Absolutely. Maybe it's only been a handful, but it definitely has to have happened for sure. So why would you handle that conversation, Kent? Um, if if your coing there shows up with a portable live front facing sonar unit. Man, it'd be tough, you know, like I I want my co-anglers to have a good experience as, you know, as much as anybody, but at the same time, if their live scope is interfering with mine and, you know, if it's a problem with them to pull it out of the water and get their stuff in, in, uh, in shape to travel to the next spot. And that's like costing me time. Like, that's not going to work for me. You know, like, I don't know. It's, it, it would be a tough conversation. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, um, to that perspective, it'd be the same conversation as somebody that's got six rods, spider webbed, crappie rigging all over the back deck. And you're like, Hey, I'm about ready to go. And they're like, okay. It's like, yeah. like, I mean, that's, that's like your 30 second warning to like be ready to go. Otherwise, <laughs> um, that and then i think i think you could use the same application within reason like you know there's a i guess there's no hard rule that they can't cast front of the gunnel right or the, the council but like that's kind of a reasonable expectation that they're not crowding your water it'd be like all right well you shoot yours this way and i won't shoot mine back that way and we'll you know like and i guess if he's like pointing and quartering off the passenger side backwards and picking off fish well like you weren't going to catch those anyways so um so i guess yeah, it, I, it all comes down yeah. to respect in the end right so i think and they would have to have their own battery too because i i've got my battery capacity figured out yeah. for the stuff that i have in my boat so well i think absolutely i don't that would be insane to be like do you mind if i plug this into your cigarette lighter or like <laughs> can i open your compartment and throw some gator clips on your and then no no that no. yeah i mean i think most of them you can run off like a drill something right so it's pretty easy though yeah yeah yeah, and if they're hanging it over the edge and it's not causing any problems, I mean, I guess more power to them if they if they want to deal with having that thing with them all day. All right. So if you, uh, I don't know, I mean, it's, I'm sure you fished Hartwell and a few other places like that. What are your techniques for those Ozark or Highland and Poutman type reservoirs? Uh, I like the shaky head. Um, shaky head doesn't get much love up in Minnesota, but man, it is good basically everywhere else that we go. Maybe not so much Florida, but any of the uh, any of the reservoir type lakes. Yeah, the shaky. Oh, the yeah. jigworm here, Kent. <laughs> well, that's a little bit different. Um, I'm just kidding, but like that—that's why we don't throw a shaky head because we're all throwing jigworms for whatever reason. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, sh the shaky head surprisingly goes through absolutely everything. Like I like it around wood. Um, so rocky, rocky reservoirs. A lot of times, if you're fishing the bank, it'll you'll get some wood to fish too. And uh, shaky head's great. Um, yeah, hashtag shaky life for sure. Um, but yeah, you can. I mean, it's so versatile. You can fish it in kind of any any depth and you can fish it over any type of cover you can target cast or just kind of drag it um through transition 
rock or whatever. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different things you can do with it. But yeah, beyond that, and uh, I like cranking a lot on that type of body of water. So whether it's deep cranks or medium running, or if I'm right up on the bank with square bills. But yeah, that's uh, fishing lay downs is super fun. Mm -hmm. and cranking them and shaky heads and that throwing a little bit of jig. Got to have picked up the jig a lot more in the last year than I have ever before. Yeah, I knew you'd be proud of that. Um, so I've been loving the jig too. <laughs> Um, yeah, actually the jig worm, I actually was catching a few fish in practice on Gunnersville in the grass on a jig worm back then. 18, is that when we were there? 19, whatever it was. Yeah, 19. Yeah, um, I can see, I can see that. That's, uh, it's a good, I mean, it's a really good technique. I, I feel like it's different than the shaky head enough because of that exposed hook that it gets hung up on the grass and that's kind of the whole thing with it is to to try and get it hung on the grass and pop it out of there it's almost like that's a, why a lipless fishing. at that point right it's like a yeah getting the reaction yeah um so if i'm not mistaken i feel like you fill out a lot of omnia fishing reports as you're traveling around true false I do. I do. I've been doing a lot with them. I've uh, been filling out a lot here in Florida. And I try and remember to film out wherever I go across the country and um, film out when I'm in Minnesota, um, kind of in the north central uh, Alexandria type area when I'm up there too. So yeah, Omni reports, they're fun. They're fun. And I feel like it's super useful information for people too, because you can learn a lot about the lakes and what's going on currently at those bodies of water and kind of what's working and uh yeah i've been uh i've been really enjoying it do you ever use them for research i do yeah a little bit um i i use them for just kind of getting some general ideas uh what baits are working um and um yeah i mean it's it's good it's good for water temp too like if you're trying to figure out what what water temp is on a certain body of water you can go through their maps page or lakes page and then click on the lake that you're interested in and basically get real-time data or within pretty recent depending on the region like we're we're working on getting more reports across the country and they're coming in a lot, but, uh, but you know, it's, uh, Omni is a Minnesota company. And so a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the information is Minnesota based, but we are getting better, better and better nationwide. But yeah, so caught some bass on my birthday in, in uh, Iowa, it looks like good job. Yeah. I love, I love that late season smallmouth fishing in Iowa. I had to fact but, check and make sure you'd gotten some recent reports up. So it looks like you've been <laughs> some. I have, yeah. And, and as of recently, I've been adding more video to it too. I, I, I've, I've recently got kind of interested in uh, doing some video work. I am going to record my um, travels this year on the opens as well. And uh, so I'm, I've used, I'm using the reports as kind of getting some practice with editing and that type of thing. And I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with it. It's really enjoyable. Cool. So, but it makes for, I think it makes for some good, re good reports and something quick and easy to watch real quick and see a couple fish catches, learn about the lake. And um, yeah, it's, it's good. Nice. Very cool. That's one thing I haven't done. I haven't played around with video. I tried one and it didn't like work. And then I just went back to photos and my fishing reports, but uh, that's cool. So it looks like if you want to go, you can go to Kent Middlestat's uh, Omni Ambassador page, and you can follow him on Instagram, Facebook. You can check out his soon-to-be flourishing YouTube channel, where he's going to be posting a lot more. Yeah, I, you know, I, YouTube has been tough for me, man. I I have a hard time coming up with ideas of what to post. You know, there's there's already so many people doing so many great things on YouTube, like you and 
I don't know, some of the guys we talked about before, it's like intimidating for me, but uh, I, I'm watching some of the guys um, record their travels on the opens was just kind of inspiring to me to just have fun with it and have something to document my travels. And, um, you know, if people want to see what it's like to fish the opens, maybe I can show them something fun and uh, have some fun with the video work myself. So yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to it. It's interesting. Cause like you got so many things, right? You've got like on one end of the spectrum, you've got Cooper Gallant. who's making like a made for TV, like long form movie discovery channel, like documentary for every open, right? Like drones yeah. and multiple cameras and hours and hours of editing. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you got Jim Moyna sitting in a camper holding his cell phone and just raw, just off the top of the head. So, you know, I think there's like all that space in between. And I think as long as you're willing to make it your own and, and experiment, I think there's, there's a place for everything in between and an audience for it. For sure. Good advice. Cool. Man, almost two hours. What, uh, is there anything else we needed to, Oh, I should say that fancy fishing is up. Beat Halabas group is up. Password is Visor, all capital letters. For anybody that hasn't joined yet, Kent, do you ever play fantasy fishing? I do a little bit. I uh, I don't I don't join tons of groups. I kind of play with some of the old guys from the club and sure. um, try and try and make sure that I can at, at least beat them. But I don't know if I can beat Rich. There's a lot of people that do. I mean, at least ten percent <laughs> of people typically do, but. So I did beat Ronnie Moore last year. I mean, just saying, you know, not a big deal. But can I win anything? You can. So in my group, I don't have the prizes exactly figured out this year, um, but I will be giving away prizes for each event, drain the lake and regular. Uh, I do have uh, some year-end prizes set up. We're gonna get some super pay gift cards in for that. <clears throat> um, but if nothing else, I'll just buy a bunch of tactical minnows and you know some, some cool stuff from arsenal and give it away so i'm in worst, worst case worst case that's what you're gonna get so um yeah i'll i'll get it up you'll you'll well actually i, I actually recorded my like season intro today so that'll come out and then uh i got like two weeks to get my okeechobee video done it'll be there it'll be there and plus, you can still win like the overall prize, right? All the Rapla, like the big prizes. But yeah, I, the Beat Hell Bass Group has. You're playing in a much smaller pool. It is the largest private group on Bassmaster Fantasy Fishing, which will be a few hundred people. But you're not necessarily playing against thousands for prizes, so it's a little more intimate environment. And then if you join in the streams, you can trash talk the people on the streams and that kind of stuff. So it's it's kind of fun. Keeps it keeps it in the community. Yeah, it's good times. I, I find myself uh, picking a lot of the guys from the Opens just because I, I uh, know that what they're capable of. And, um, man, a lot, a lot of those guys I'm so impressed by. And it uh, doesn't always work out great, but it is kind of nice to have a little bit of insider knowledge. <laughs> yeah, kind of gives you a rooting interest, right? And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's not like high stakes, right? It's 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 mostly for fun, and so you make you, you kind of put your own spin on it to get the the, the enjoyment out of it. Um, and then uh, yeah, I was gonna say next week gonna be back on Wednesday, a normal night. I'm having Epic Eric on, and we decided we are going to uh, we're all gonna we're, I'm gonna share some of my juiciest bait hacks, and Epic Eric is as well. So that might oh, be kind of a fun stream. That'll be a good one. Oh yeah, are we still going to have the questions with Kent on Instagram? Oh, we need to bring that back. I yeah. think instead of posting those as stories, you should post those as reels and YouTube Shorts. I like it. I'll I'll try that. I I I don't know. Yeah, the uh, the whole Instagram YouTube game is is. Uh, you you can multi-purpose that content instead of just posting it as a story and it disappears in twenty four hours. You just record it independently, and you can upload it to TikTok. You can upload it to YouTube Short and Instagram, and it's just it's all the same piece. Then, yeah, we had fun with it. We'll bring it back. Yeah, 
Plus, then you're not the star of the show at that point. So, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Is there anything else going on? I'm trying to. I feel like we covered a lot of territory. Um, excited. So we what? Uh, and remind us again. It it starts a little later this year, right? Is it the first open in March? It is. Yeah, March second. So uh, I I think I start heading up um, to you, Fala. So. I, I'm down in Florida. You follow is about six hours away from here, north, and uh, start heading up that way towards the end of February. So it is, yeah, it's um, it's maybe a little bit later, but about right. It it kind of fluctuated from a Florida event usually in towards the end of January, and sometimes it'd be mid to late February. So we're maybe a little later than normal, but yeah, we're kicking it off here. In uh, about three weeks, I'll start heading up that way. Nice. Yeah, Amy, let them know. People want to know how they get a suck less hoodie. Um, or instant message or DM, Instagram, get a hold of Amy. Uh, so are you officially retired from the Bass Nation, or do you feel like you're still going to come back and fish some state tournaments at some point? Um, I'm not going to be able to fish Bass Nation TOC this year. Um but I'm definitely not retired. I, I think it's still a great opportunity um, for people that want to try and make it to the Elite Series even. It's it's still a really good path. You know, it's only one person that qualifies, but in the Opens, it's only nine people, you know, and it's, it's, it's tough no matter which path you choose. Um, the, but the Bass Nation route is still something that I want to keep open. It's just unfortunately not going to work out timing wise with the nine opens and time off and all that is is not going to happen to do the toc this year but i won't rule it out in the future nice yeah have you heard they're kind of revamping it i have not okay well we'll save that for so i'm going to go assuming my wisdom teeth removal tomorrow goes smoothly i'm going to try to go to the state meeting on saturday um and uh, get the download. In Minnesota, some nuggets, but what's that? Revamping in Minnesota or in uh, general? National, nationally. I heard. Uh, I heard a little bit of something, but I haven't heard much. So I'm looking to looking forward to hear what you have to say. Yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll try to get the official report download. I've kind of I think I know what's going on, but I don't want to like speculate and spread rumors until I really see it written or from somebody that actually knows. So. So if I'm not there, Dan, that means my face is like all puffed up and I, and I didn't make it. So I'm only getting five teeth removed tomorrow, so I'm sure I'll be fine for Saturday. That should be good. Yeah, not a big deal. Hey, you get to be on the ice cream diet though, right? I did stop. Like that's actually why I was late texting you the stream or the link is because I stopped at the, after dropping my daughter off at soccer, was getting ice cream in preparation for this weekend. <laughs> I went I with a it. gallon of uh, mint chocolate chip. What do you think of that decision? Eh, I mean, not a mint chocolate cr- chip guy. It's I wouldn't I wouldn't put it in my top five, but I wouldn't turn it down either. All right. So what's uh, let's I mean, let's get to the important stuff. What is Kent's top three ice cream flavors? Uh well, cookie dough is up there, and I don't know if you know, well, I don't know if cookie dough is a great wisdom teeth choice right because you got big chunks in it but yeah that probably wouldn't work out too well um and i don't know if you can count blizzard flavors but uh i am gonna throw <laughs> i am gonna throw in reese's peanut butter cup because there's something about peanut butter and ice cream that just go so well together i mean there's a plenty of uh knockoff versions that are basically peanut like you know moose track peanut butter chunky i mean there, there's plenty of that in the grocery store for sure it's good i like it and then I'm going to throw in, um, is it Briars uh, Vanilla Bean? Byer, oh, Byers? Straight. Briars? Yeah, or, or Hagen does Vanilla Bean. Yeah, those are. Those like a are high good. end vanilla. I got it. Yeah, high end vanilla option is key. Yeah, I probably should have went straight vanilla, but. I did get some sorbet. I went with some pineapple sorbet because supposedly pineapple has like a. a uh, an additive in it that helps with inflammation and stuff like that. So I like it. It's healthy. There you go. Yeah. 
now we're, we could do a whole other hour on ice cream flavors probably <laughs> uh are you are you going to the classic i am not will not be at the classic no i um don't don't have any uh reason to go i i I think it sounds kind of fun to go to the expo, but um, no, I, I, I'll be fishing. Nice. I'm contemplating attending my first classic expo this year. I I don't think I'm going to go to the weigh-in because I'm thinking I'm going to drive through it the first time I go through the weigh-in. Um, there you go. Uh, but I'm kind of thinking going down there, there's enough people that through the community we can meet up and, and say hi to people and maybe do some networking. So I'm, I'm seriously contemplating making the drive or the – the flight down to Knoxville this year. Yeah, I was uh, I was just looking at the map. I'm going to be right in that area later this year for an open, so I could maybe go there and pre-practice. But I've never I've never really pre-practiced. Well, I guess I have a few times um, for an open, but it's not not my normal deal. Yeah, we got Watts Bar, which is basically right there. It'll be a gar hole by the time your open field gets done fishing it. <laughs> Isn't that in September already? Like Tennessee River, September? That's going to be brutal. Yeah. Well, it's got smallmouth in it, so hopefully hopefully uh, they're willing to bite. Yeah, jackhammer or a pint of ice cream? It's a tough choice. <laughs> We lose rich. Yeah, I pressed the wrong button. I went to stop the screen presenting and I hit the leave studio. But yeah, we were going like, to like a left. Man, oh, like where you just like mid set and stock. <laughs> um, but uh, well, appreciate having you on, Kent. Uh, look forward to uh, watching you and all your uh, 174 best friends tackling the EQs this year. Appreciate uh, it. Thanks for having me on, man. This is fun. Good to catch yeah. up. It's getting getting kind of late now. I mean, this is. Uh, 11 o'clock for you you gotta get to bed so you can get up and get your hours in so you can go out fishing tomorrow night yeah that's right exactly right cool deal um well thanks for coming on uh, you guys i think I, I think the best way to follow kent is to go to his omni ambassador page and then just click on the links to the rest of his social i think that'd be the best way to follow him good I'll suggestion put, I'll put a link to his uh, ambassador page in the description for you guys and that'll be the easiest way um and uh if you came in late i think there was a lot of good value replay facebook uh youtube however you came in or you can down, just search hellabass in your favorite podcast app and listen to it when you're driving to the lake walking the dog on your fit tuesday night fishing adventures like kent i'm sure like that's when you listen to all the hellabass podcasts right exactly yeah <laughs> at the gym fishing adventures driving down the road i get plenty of podcast time in so Nice. All right. Well, enjoy the content. Well, thanks, everybody. As always, here to help you guys catch more big bass and suck less. Thanks.